So hello, everyone. My name is Jennifer Schuler, and I'm the cultural attache at the US Embassy in Athens. As many of you know, our embassy is one of the co-organizers of the Co-Museum International Conference, along with the Benaki Museum and the British Council. Therefore, on behalf of the Co-Museum team and the US Embassy, I would like to welcome you all to today's leadership talk on cultural and educational programs and partnerships in challenging times. For those of you who are joining, may we ask that you please mute your microphones as we start today's program. Today's program is going to be hosted by Cynthia Harvey, the Counselor for Public Affairs at the U.S. Embassy. This co-museum series evolved out of the pandemic as a way for people to discuss and share their experiences, insights, and solutions in the midst of a very challenging time. The first event in the series was hosted by British Council Director Anastasia Andritsu in September. And the second event was hosted by Benaki Museum Academic Director George Manzinis last week. Both are available for viewing on the Co-Museum YouTube channel. It makes perfect sense for the Co-Museum to be hosting these conversations. Since 2011, the Co-Museum Annual Conference has been serving as a global platform for cultural organizations and the communities they serve, aiming to foster the production and exchange of ideas among cultural and arts professionals around the globe. You can find more information about the Co-Museum online, and we'd love for you to visit us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Now, before I turn over today's event to Cindy, I'll share just a few house rules. For those of you not joining us as panelists, we'd ask that you please mute your microphones and turn off your cameras for today's discussion. We will take questions for our Q&A session via the chat box, so please ask your questions there. And do include your name and your organization with your question. Please feel free to submit your questions at any time, even before the Q&A session starts. And in case you face any technical issues, with the chat box, you can always send your questions via email to info at thecomuseum.org. We welcome the sharing of links and resources in the chat box during the session, so please feel free to do that. And finally, please do note that our discussion will be recorded for later posting online. So please, again, make sure that your mics and cameras are off. This will maintain the best video and sound quality for our speakers and will also help you maintain your privacy. Thank you very much to everyone for joining us today. And with that, I'll turn the discussion over to our moderator, Cynthia Harvey. Cindy? Thank you, Jennifer. Kalispera, everybody. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today for what I hope will be a really interesting and, and insightful discussion. With many countries facing the second wave of COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic and communities struggling to cope with the effects of this unprecedented crisis, our cultural and our educational institutions are also facing significant challenges in how they operate, how they program, and how they build their audiences. So at this time of crisis, when art, culture, knowledge, and the sense of community that these institutions offer are needed more than ever, Many of those institutions remain closed or with limitations on the number of visitors that they can host. So when we started planning this event, Greek museums and cultural organizations were open after having faced the first lockdown last spring. But unfortunately now we're back in a situation where all indoor cultural spaces are um, closed and most and outdoor uh, cultural spaces and ar archeological sites are also closed. It's an unpredictable environment and so the role of leadership is more critical than ever. So that's why I'm honored to be welcoming three exceptional leaders in the fields of culture and education to share their thoughts and experiences during these challenging times and to share their visions for the way forward. We have with us Professor Jennifer Niles, the Director of the American School of Classical Studies in Athens, Gabriela Triadafidis, the Director of Programming and Production at the Stavros Niarchos Foundation Cultural Center, and Liz Tunick, the Manager of the cultural, Global Cultural Sustainability Program in the Office of International Relations at the Smithsonian Institution in the United States. 
As we get started, I thought we could focus first on the impact of the shutdown and um, as well as the ongoing social distancing measures on your various organizations and programs. So I'm just going to jump right in and I'll start with you, Jennifer. Uh, your organization has an extensive summer excavation program in the Athens Agora, Corinth, Pylos, and elsewhere. You also welcome dozens of archaeologists and researchers throughout the year. How have the travel bans and other pandemic-related measures impacted the research conducted by the American School? And what steps have you taken to address those challenges? Right, let me just by saying that we, the American School of Classical Studies in Athens, if you don't know it, is a, is a small research institute. Um, so compared to the Smithsonian and the Nearchus Foundation, we're a rather small operation, but we've been around for 140 years. Um, and we have a very wide reach because we have as supporting members over 200 colleges and universities in the United States. And their, their academic staff, uh, there are some 400 are members of the school and part of our managing team. So, so we encompass um, much of the, many of the academic institutions in North America and Canada. Um, and as Cynthia said, we run we run six summer programs, all of which we canceled this year. This is everything from a seminar, a scientific archaeological seminar on soil formation, <laughs> all the way to a class on medieval Greek. So um, none of those took place, and we had to cancel for this year our nine-month program for PhD students. Um, so th that was ongoing in last year, and we ended it that in March. And um, we haven't taken any students in for this year, although I'm happy to say that many of the students that were in the program last year decided to stay in Greece because we managed to keep our library open, unlike the libraries in back in the United States at colleges and universities. So they were thrilled to be here I, until today. But, but I mean, as of tomorrow, when we have to close the library again. But but they in the meantime, they got a lot of work done. And um, one thing we're doing to help scholars um, here is to, for the first time in 140 years, to actually loan out books. We're letting some of our precious library go out so they can use this in their in their apartments. So um, that's where where we are. Um, I can go on and talk maybe a little later. I'll let my colleague speak um, to talk about this, our outreach, which involves um, a, a rather extensive webinar program. So that's what we're doing. Um, we've switched gears to, um, luckily, we have some very good in-house staff, a videographer, professional videographer on the staff, and um, this is how we're continuing to um, work in the light of the fact that we cannot use our big lecture hall and have um, public lectures. And that by, by moving to those um, webinars, you probably are able to attract audiences that um, you wouldn't have otherwise, I would imagine. Yeah, I can tell you that. This is this is transformational for us because yeah. we had uh, I don't know room for 300 people in our auditorium and now we have you know 2,000 people signing up mm -hmm. to watch these webinars. We do them at seven at night so that you know it's noon in, in the United States and people <laughs> it's become their lunch hour entertainment. I guess um, mm -hmm. I'll just give you one example. We did one about our excavations in Corinth, the ancient city of Corinth. It, this was done in Greek about the uh, you know the introduction to the site. And we had 10,000 viewers for this. And the majority of them were actually, we can do the demographics on this. They were Greek women between the ages of 35 and 45 uh, from the Peloponnese. This is from Southern Greece. So this is just totally amazing because we've never had that kind of an audience before. So this is, you know, this is the silver lining, you know, with the, COVID, the pandemic. It's allowed us to um, show off the work we do and the work we've been doing for you know, over a century uh, to to much wider audiences. Yeah. That's terrific. That's a great story. <laughs> Gabriella, I'd like to move on to you. Um, the Stavros Niarchos Foundation Cultural Center hosts more than 3,000 events every year, which is an incredible amount. Um, so how did you transition S at, um, SNFCC from this kind of programming format to um, what we experienced in the lockdown. What what did you do in that case? And what trends are you monitoring now as a result of having made those transitions? Um, what kind of visitorship and engagement were you getting after you came back from the lockdown? And just any, do you have any takeaways um, from the experience of lessons learned, similar to what Jennifer said about, you know, that there are audiences out there that we hadn't thought of before or anything like that that you can share with us? 
So hi from me too. It's thank you for the invitation and for being here. Um, as a as a first point of introduction, let me say that the Stavros Niakos Foundation Cultural Center is the Stavros Niakos Foundation's largest grant to date. So we are three constituent organizations uh, hosted here: the Greek National Opera, the National Library of Greece, as well as the SNFCCSA, the the company that I I work and I program for. Um, we mainly program outdoor events, ranging from yoga classes to to big scale concerts and from performances to educational workshops. So our our core um, mission was to re-engage people in what what public space was so the first this first lockdown was a big uh, shock let's say for us because we had to what what was the given for us and what was our big success the space people are being attracted here was suddenly removed from us so what we what we did at that point was to we reshuffled everything and we redesigned our program. We just we didn't just uh, turn into digital what programming we had available for that time. So we withdrew everything and designed from scratch uh, lectures, concerts, um, uh, workshops, athletics. But everything was designed to, as a digital event, which I think is a, is a key component uh, to to what actually was proved to be a success for us, because it's it's not the same event is not you cannot treat the same event both as a digital one and as a physical one. So it, I, we believe it's extremely important when you want to present and to create uh, a, a, a digital event to treat it as such. Um, it was uh, a stressful but yet um, a successful period for us because we did as well uh, manage to get to audiences that we wouldn't necessarily have managed to because as an institution, as a venue, um, we attract people here. So now we manage to get into people's homes and to their PCs and their computers, which could be anywhere, not just in, in, in Greece, but all around the globe. Um, we had comments for, to on to our, our live uh, concert saying, hi, we're tuning in from Sweden, we're tuning in from uh, the, from New York, which which was um, which was very, very uh, emotional, especially when our first concerts took place during the first lockdown. So when everybody was actually locked in their own houses. So it was a, a way where we, we once again were a meeting point. Um, now we are preparing for the second lockdown, so uh, we have other past as a given. We have what happened in the spring as a given, but we still have a long way to to go uh, in order to not just maintain what the SNFCC is, but to expand it in a different way as well. Sorry, uh, it kind of, sorry, Cindy. It uh, your your image. I was going to mute myself, and then look what I did. Okay, thank you, uh, Liz. I'd love to come with you with a question. Um, you incredibly at the Smithsonian welcome thirty million visitors a year um, at your museums, and you also engage in science and conservation, with and you have cultural partnerships with organizations in about one hundred and forty countries. So I wanted to ask, are you maintaining those partnerships uh, and your international collaborations? How are you doing so? And I also wanted to ask you just a, a little bit about just, you know, overall leadership in the organization. How has leadership of the Smithsonian set the, the tone for how you are approaching this very, or how you approach this very challenging period? Thank you, and good morning and good afternoon to everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here, uh, and I think that this conversation is such a great example of how cultural organizations are stepping up during this time. Um, I work for the Smithsonian Institution. Some people are familiar with it, some are not. We're the world's largest museum education and research complex in the world. So we have 19 different museums, nine research centers, and the National Zoo. So as, as Cindy said, normally we are a very busy place, welcoming millions of people from all over the world through our doors. 
When we had to close our doors in March, obviously that was a difficult time um, and a moment where we really had to reconsider how we could be a resource for the world, how we could continue to serve our audiences. Um, and so, you know, I think that cultural organizations are nothing if not resourceful. We have always been able to make a lot with a little. Um, and I think that museums in particular now have really shown their grit and shown what they are able to do. Um, and, you know, there are so many examples of this, but obviously I'll just be speaking about the Smithsonian today. In terms of our partnerships, I think one of the things the Smithsonian has always done very well is realize that we are part of a vast ecosystem of partners around the world. And so just like we bring research and expertise to the table, so too do our partners. And so we've been relying a lot on those partnerships over the last couple of months. Um, for example, a lot of our scientists who normally would be out researching in the field all summer long, um, instead were collaborating with their colleagues on the ground, who some of whom were able to do that research, some not. Um, I, one of the things we've seen, of course, is that a lot of people have now had time to do things they hadn't been able to do before. So I was talking to uh, a scientist colleague and friend of mine who said she has produced a lot more writing in the last few months than she has been able to do uh, recently. So again, trying to look at some of the silver linings. Um, just to touch quickly on leadership, and I know we'll talk a lot more about all of these throughout the hour. Leadership at the institution has been so important, and we are very lucky at the Smithsonian to have a relatively new secretary who has been a brilliant, brilliant leader, um, both for the staff of the Smithsonian, which has been incredibly important, but also for the public. I think he has made a big effort to remain in touch, remain in very close touch with all of us through this time, validating what a difficult period this is, but also reminding us of our incredible responsibility to the public. Um, and I did just want to share something that he he has said that, that I think about all the time. He said, at a time of pain, we need institutions that remind us of beauty. At a time of divisiveness, we need museums to remind us we've been through this before. For me, it's about public service. And I think about that all the time. You know, we really do have this um, incredible position to be a force for good in the world at a time of so many challenges. And there are a lot of ways we're doing that. And I, I will stop there just to let others jump in. But I, I have some examples that I look forward to sharing. OK, thanks, Liz. That's actually a really terrific quote, and it means a lot. So thanks for sharing that. Um, Jennifer, I'm going to come back to you we'll, and pick up where we left off with your dazzling success moving into the um, digital sphere. Um, and I just want to drill down on that a little bit. Um, can you tell us just how specifically you managed that transition? So did you hire new staff with the skill set that you needed? Um, were there any kind of, was it all success or did you start with something and you tweaked and then got to where you wanted to be? If you can sh you know, share anything about that journey and just, I mean, moving forward when COVID-19 is just a distant memory and that we read about in the history books, are there any takeaways from this experience of moving into the virtual sphere that you will, that are now going to just become part of your core operations there at the American School of Classical Studies? Okay. Well, <laughs> Can you, my major, our major undertaking here was um, to move into the webinar sphere. We have always had a, a very robust lecture series on everything from, you know, prehistoric Greece to the Ottoman period and beyond um, in our wonderful lecture hall. Um, and these have for years been uh, recorded and disseminated through our very extensive video archive, and I can put a link on that in the chat. We have something like, um, I don't know, 536 video lectures, which people, which scholars and universities and everyone can, can use. But um, when we came to doing virtual, we decided we should um, have more live and <laughs> performances. So uh, luckily on our staff, we had a uh, IT, manager who had taken some videography courses and it turns out he's brilliant at this and um, we've got some equipment from a donor who stepped up and gave us some cameras and most importantly a drone 
So uh, he loves to go out. He's been at, he was at the Agora yesterday at six in the morning so we can get good shots over, over that excavation because we had a program coming up. Beautiful, beautiful drone shots everywhere. So we were very, very lucky in that regard. The, the feedback has been incredibly positive. I mean, there's some people who say, have written and said, you know, you're keeping me sane with, by virtue of these programs or, you know, keep up the good work. You, you, you know, you're doing it really well. I, I think we were lucky. I don't think there are 17 foreign schools in Greece, archaeological institutes from 17 countries, and I don't think any of them has been able to quite mount this Kind of this kind of programming. So I mean, even though they have like you know they have video lectures, but but we've gone above and beyond that. And um, so that you know, there's no um, we miss having scholars here in person, of course, and, and that's one of the great things we've always done. We've also done some virtual concerts because the Curtis Institute has always sent us musicians every year, and they they made a, a concert for us to to um, to produce vi virtually out there to people who wanted to see it. So, um, you know, we'll get through this and I think probably in the future we'll continue to do these videos because we can pitch them at different levels. Normally our scholars who lecture here, it's at a very high academic level, but we have, you know, live from our excavations and this, the, the audiences are incredibly broad. You can tell that from the questions, you know, people who've never been to Greece or never heard of the Athenian Agora, didn't know democracy started there and all these other things. So we can pitch these at, you know, high school, college level, and these can be used in courses. So I think um, that we will definitely continue uh, in this vein and probably expand and do more and more um, as time and uh, permits allow. We have to get permits from the Greek ministry to, to do this kind of photography, but um, it's been uh, really highly successful. And luckily, I want to say that because this American school has a somewhat healthy endowment. We haven't had, we didn't furlough any of our employees. We kept them employed during during uh, all during the COVID period. And um, so their morale is pretty good here. Good. That's great. Um, and especially, you know, fun with drones. So that sounds like yeah. if that would be well, morale for sure. Should I just mention the U.S. Embassy connection? We did a, <laughs> uh, we, you know, opportunistically take advantage of what's going on in relation to the ancient world. So we had a 2500th anniversary webinar on the Battle of Salamis, which was sort of very instrumental for, for uh, keeping Athens, uh, you know, um, from under the Persian yoke. And when I asked the embassy if they could say maybe since this is a naval battle, like could they send someone from the Navy to maybe comment on naval operations in the Eastern Mediterranean, make it relevant for today? Um, Cynthia called me back and said, well, the ambassador wants to speak. <laughs> he read this book on Salamis and he was very enthusiastic and he did a wonderful job. So we feel very grateful to the embassy for <laughs> supporting we're, this project. We're, that was a lucky strike that day. You happened to be asking about a book that he had been talking about publicly quite a bit. So it was it was just perfect <laughs> timing. Like, it was great. Okay. Um, Gabriella, I'd like to come back to you. You mentioned uh, previously um, the importance of your actual building at the Star Stavros Niarchos um, Cultural Center. And I mean, it is a landmark building. It's absolutely stunning. And so um, I wanted to just ask what the impact of the COVID-19 measures were on how you're operating the actual physical um, facilities that, 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 that you manage. Like how did you cope with having to shut it down to the public? How did you bring it back up afterwards? Did you get a rush of interest after the end of the first lockdown? Um, and just what do you anticipate now as we're looking at the second lockdown? Um, and what what was the economic in impacts of having to go through the past lockdown and now as we're looking at, at this next phase? So uh, in the phase, uh, the first phase of the lockdown, obviously the SNFCC and its entity was closed to the public, so nobody could could visit it. What we did uh, once quarantine was 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 waived, we we gradually opened the space for um, through a system of pre-booking. So you would uh, pre-book your slots in order to to access the space. This of course was free of charge. So, and, and in a way, we tried to to uh, introduce to our audience a gradual way of returning. Um, uh, in about uh, late June, we completely removed the system, but at the same time, we introduced maximum capacities in all of our 
events, as well as the events in the Great Lawn, which was um, which was a challenge because uh, open air cinemas uh, are a are great big event for us at the SNFCC. So what we did is that we drew this two uh, meter cycles, circles in, in the Great Lawn, which were two meters away from the next one. So we could host people there for, for screenings, which they were again, in a way, uh, distanced. So we worked uh, in a very subtle, what we consider it to be in a subtle way of social distancing, but still being present at the SNFCC, being there um, at the point. Um, this went really well. Uh, around uh, mid-July, we even managed to welcome a small number of audience members in to our concerts as well. But um, then again, this is uh, not possible anymore. Um, financially wise, our programming is uh, taking place um, uh, through the uh, exclusive support of the Stavros Nepos Foundation. So thankfully, we didn't have to cut any of our events. Uh, so we, we have this support, which is extremely valuable and important to us. Um, uh, which means that we 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 have the ability, we have the capacity to continue despite the, the, these challenges. Uh, but this, unfortunately, is not the same with most of the art sector and the performing arts sector, who face extremely big challenges of not being able to not just to support their art and their art form, but their being as well. Okay, thanks for that, Gabriella. And that's that's a really important point for all of us to remember is just that the, the livelihoods of so many people in the culture and the arts has just been challenged greatly by this. Um, Unfortunately, to a, to, a, to a great event, to a, to a great extent. I mean, it's, yeah. Um, Liz, let me um, come back to you. So the Smithsonian has millions of objects, specimens, uh, even live animals in its <laughs> collection. Uh, I assume that's at the at the zoo in Washington D.C. Um, I wanted to just ask if you could talk about how you brought that content to life through very your websites or through your digital approach. Can you just um, talk to us a little bit about how you moved things online? Of course. of course, the Smithsonian's mission is the increase and diffusion of knowledge. And of course, that happens in so many ways. And, you know, we have, as you said, millions and millions of things in our collection. We have a vast mosquito collection in case anyone is interested in mosquitoes and insects. Um, but one of the things we've had to do is get really creative with how to help people engage with that collection online. And so like a lot of organizations, we are trying to think how we make online programming and online resources exciting to different audiences. Um, so we have done that in a number of ways. One of the things the Smithsonian did was we launched something called Smithsonian Cares. Um, and that was our way of saying that we wanna continue supporting and helping um, the public in a time of great need. Um, and that's everything from vast digital resources um, that education teams are helping to put out so that there are distance learning resources for caregivers, for students, for teachers, for adults, um, but also so that we give people pleasure, so that we have things for adults. Um, Jennifer referenced this before, one of the things we've done is made sure that we are offering things at all different times of day for different people. You know, some people can log in during their lunch hour, some people can't log in until their children are in bed. Um, so we've been playing around with doing programs at different times. And it's also allowed us to be really creative in the kinds of programs we have. So one of the events that, that I love to talk about is a program through the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden, which is our modern and contemporary art museum. They've started something called Hirshhorn Artist Diaries, and it's a living archive that captures the responses of contemporary international artists to the pandemic in their own voices. And so it's this way of really having um, a conversation and hearing what's happening with real people. Um, and it's sort of diary style videos that are gonna become part of the Hirshhorn's collection recording the impact of the, of the pandemic and their views on the world. 
Um, I think that one of the things that we have realized, again, is that people learn in all kinds of different ways. So some people want to read something online. Um, and so we've tried to make our content feel relevant and really resonate with people. So for example, there's an article on dolphins and social distancing. So, you know, trying to respond to the time while also making things educational and interesting and, and again, supporting our mission. Um, but we also do a lot of programs that are hands on and try to get people a, a little more active. And that can be both for adults and for youth. Um, so trying to create some of that fun spirit that would be happening um, if people were actually able to come through our doors. Um, and then one of the things that that you reference in terms of, you know, bringing our collection out is just the whole topic of accessibility. Um, and thinking about bringing our collections online is something that started well before the pandemic. But of course, the pandemic really forced us um, to think in some new ways about how we're doing that, how we're talking about that. Um, and so we have a lot of our collection that's been digitized and placed online. Um, and we're working very actively on trying to continue to do that. Um, and that, again, is both so that researchers can, can have access to our collections, but also so that everyone can have access to our collections. Um, so again, you know, that's something that started before the pandemic, but the pandemic really made that uh, all the more important. Okay, thanks, Liz. Um, Gabriella, I wanted to come back to you to um, take a closer look at something that you mentioned. Um, so you had said that, um, the, um, that you had hosted a series of concerts with seated guests earlier in the fall. Um, in a, you know, you were create, building an audience. And I wondered um, what kind of, you know, how, if you could speak specifically about how you manage that process of safely getting members of the public into the space to enjoy a live performance. And um, did you get any feedback from the audience on how they experienced that or from the performers, what it was like? I assume it was not a full concert hall because of the socially distancing requirements. So if you could just talk to us a little bit about how you manage that process. Of course, uh, during the summer, we we had it in an outdoor space, which is called the, the SNFCC Dome, it's in the park. We hosted um, a series of concerts there. And uh, earlier on in October, we hosted, I think it was just, we managed to just host two concerts at the Lighthouse. So we, we obviously had to um, comply with uh, the, the capacity that, uh, of the space, which uh, in October, if I remember my correctly, it was at 30%. So where we used to have 300 to 350 people, now we had less than 100. So pe people were distanced. You would need to leave spaces both in the front row and in the back row so it was kind of like a jigsaw puzzle um you could only book your seat online and there was no uh, there was no physical ticket uh that you could present everything had to be as contactless as as possible there were no waiting lists which is also um, a very uh, important thing so everything everybody needed to be as uh uh, dispersed as 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 possible, um, especially um, our, our one of our opening concerts in in early the first weekend of uh, uh, September was it, under an umbrella of concerts which we call music escapades, which is the Greek alternative scene. Uh, it is very important for us to support the local artists, and I think more or less uh, it, if 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 we have this discussion with any programmers and any venues around uh, Europe and, and the US, they would say that their main um, effort was to support the local scene. Um, so these, these people had not had the chance to play live since February um, at, at, the, at the earliest. So it was a very sentiment, sentimental and intense uh, concert, both for the musicians and for the audience, because people had not experienced live music. And we all know how important um, the gig scene is in Athens. I mean, there are people that continuously and on, an, on a daily basis or a weekly basis uh, go to concerts because there's a whole community uh, of, of people 
that interact and exchange ideas and move forward what they listen and what they enjoy uh, through these these events. So um, it, it was it it was important. But what was also important is the fact that these concerts and these events were also available uh, via streaming. So what we do try to, do, uh, to 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 focus on at the moment is when and where possible to have audience in right now unfortunately this is not a possibility at all but also to um to, to maintain our access through streaming and through the web to people from their homes wherever these are Thanks, Gabriella. I'm going to find that gig scene after this is all over. <laughs> uh, Liz, I'd like to come back to you. Uh, the Smithsonian offers advisory services and professional training for museums and cultural and conservation organizations around the world. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about them? And can you tell us how these services have had to be adjusted to account for these new realities that these institutions are facing? The Smithsonian has always been an international organization. Obviously, we are, are well known and beloved in the United States, but we have always maintained international partnerships. And in fact, um, the money with which we were founded was donated to the United States by an Englishman who never actually set foot in the United States. So again, we, we really have international roots. Um, as I mentioned before, these partnerships are really at the heart of a lot of what we do, and they have really gotten us through these times. One, one example I'd, I'd like to share, a relationship that we have with the National Museums of Kenya, which has been a relationship since the 1980s. Um, lots of research exchanges. We, we collaborate on a variety of different research programs but really hadn't done much when it came to developing education programs. And so for the last year and a half, so prior to, prior to the pandemic, um, a few colleagues and I had been working with educators um, at the National Museums of Kenya to develop some hands-on education programs. Obviously, we, we had to pivot a bit um, when the pandemic struck and we started thinking together about how to do online uh, education programs. This was something our, our colleagues in Nairobi had never done before. And so the first thing we did was we set up a series of conversations with their educators and IT teams, with educators and IT folks at the Smithsonian to talk about how we think about um, online programming. And that was everything from sort of macro planning, so putting together the concept for a program, to exactly what we started with in this program, make sure people mute their mics, uh, make sure people know how the chat function works. So, I mean, it was everything from sort of, again, the macro to the micro. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm really proud to say that beginning in April, um, they started launching their own online programs. And they said it was slow going at first. And at first, um, you know, they had a lot of challenges. Um, but, but now there are up to hundreds of people who are registering for these programs. They had never done that before. Um, so one of the things we did was, again, we, we just relied on our partners and we said, hey, these times are going to call for something a little bit different. And so let's figure out how to do that. Um, some of the international research, of course, has been has been disrupted, and we've had to try to to manage that as best we can. We have a, a large scale multi year program taking place in Armenia, um, a cultural tourism program, which, as you guys can imagine, um, tourism has been hard hit, of course, by the pandemic. You know, many many sectors have been, um, and so it's been a time where we've had to think about ways to continue supporting that program. Um, in some different ways. So with the different organizations that we are working with there, as opposed to thinking so much about um, tourist audiences, thinking just about capacity building. So focusing much more on strengthening staffing at these different museums. Um, but again, I think that it's, we all know everyone is experiencing a lot of fatigue, whether it's Zoom fatigue, pandemic fatigue, the fatigue is really there and it's real. Um, and so, you know, we really need to recognize that and yet 
we have to forge on. Um, you know, these organizations, as as Jennifer said, I think you know you said 150 years old, maybe. I, you know, we're about we're approaching our 175th anniversary, and these these institutions will go on. We will survive. Um, you know, people who work in museums like to say we are in the forever business. Um, you know, our, our, we have a responsibility to these collections for, for the present and for the future. Um, and we have a real responsibility to people now and for the future. One of the things we're talking a lot about, and, and I, I don't know if we have time to touch on this, is what will cultural organizations look like? What is the new normal really going to be? Um, and that's something we are talking about constantly. Um, and I think one of the things we have generally agreed upon um, is the museums are going to have a new role moving forward. I think that we're talking a lot about how museums are um, playing um, really sort of this cultural nutrient role <laughs> for the world. And, and what does it mean to be um, a cultural organization, sort of a civic organization moving forward? And that can be anything from museums, museums serving as polling sites for elections. You know, that this week we we had um, an important election in the United States and museums served as polling sites. Um, and that's not, not so new, but I think we might see more things happening like that in the future. Um, but also just museums as places for, for healing and for coming together. Um, and just one last program I want to mention is our Anacostia Community Museum. Um, has been running programs called Take Time Thursdays. And it's 30 minutes every Thursday for, again, for healing, for meditation, for checking in with ourselves. Um, and I think it's you know wonderful that a museum has been running these programs. And that's not just for Smithsonian staff, although it gets heavily publicized amongst our staff, it's for everybody. Um, and so you know I think that this is something that kind of keeps me buoyed right now is museums are going to have a role in the future and it's exciting to think about what that might look like even in in changing times. That's a great way to put it that you are in the forever business. Thank goodness for that. Um, you play such an important role. Jennifer, I'd like to come back to you. Um, you mentioned that um, the American School of Classical Studies has not had to face any staffing changes um, during the pandemic. Um, but have you, as the leader of the organization, had to manage adjustments in roles and responsibilities for your team? Um, how did that impact morale if, if they were used to doing things a certain way or certain events at a particular time of year? Was it difficult to let those, those kind of set ways of doing things go? So um, I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about you know, new roles that presented themselves, like all of a sudden you had someone who needed to be a drone expert and perhaps how you redirected the talent, skills and abilities of members of your staff who didn't have the full portfolios that they had been used to in the past. Yes, well, since most of our um, department heads and staff have PhDs and are used to teaching in one way or another, this isn't so hard to get them to do this in front of a of a camera and um, to do it, you know, live in a webinar or on site. We've done a lot of this filming on site, so um, it, it wasn't it didn't need too much training um, in that regard. But um, one of our new ventures, which opened in 2017, I don't know if you're going to come to this, is that we added a exhibition space for the first time, a, a real formal gallery, to um, our Gennadius Library. What what the American School we are in the business of forever because we have two major libraries, one for classical studies and one for post-classical. And we have a very extensive archive with things like Heinrich Schliemann's excavation notebooks and really precious objects. So finally we decided that it was time to have a, a small modest gallery open to the public. And um, this has been very successful, but it does demand, you know, personnel or at least, um, you know, we, we don't really have any resident experts. I've worked in a museum, but others, um, there's not a lot of expertise, so we have to um, hire consultants for this. In fact, we just opened a very important exhibition uh, for, for the Greek community, really, um, um, in mid-October on a, a very important diplomat, Dragoumis, and for the for the first time, I mean, we're just getting on the map and the cultural map in Athens with this gallery. And so we had 
what for us was tremendous attendance. I mean, we were only open for 20 hours. We had 200 people and because of distancing, you know, social distancing and everything, we could only let 10 people in at a time, but people were lined up outside and we were thrilled about this. And uh, it took a year to plan this. The four staff worked on it part-time, you know, for, for all this time um, because we have a huge treasure trove of these um, documents and pay family papers and things. Um, so, so it opened, it's a fabulous exhibition and now it's just closed. <laughs> so we're going to do, so we're going to have to do, you know, a web, we're going to, we were planning to do a webinar about it anyway, a, a exhibition tour, walkthrough and things like that. But, um, th this is a new venture for us and it's a way finally to show off, um, some of the real treasures that are held, um, that we were given actually by a very important Greek book collector, Gennadius. And um, in, in the 1920s, and thanks to Andrew Carnegie, we have a beautiful Carnegie Library here to house things. And um, so it's about, it's time, you know, we had a, a real venue for this, but that this is not what normal research institutes do. They don't normally have, um, deal with exhibitions and all that, all that's involved in that. And if, if anyone's ever done one, they know how much back work has to prep has to be done beforehand and publicity and everything else. So that I think that's our, newest venture and again it's it's demanding and challenging for us but um i think we're doing a pretty good job with it so um so um that that will need some kind of maybe not permanent personnel but you know interns and people to help us with this but it's a great part of our more extended now outreach to to the greek public you know, and we hope to continue to do more of that Uh, I'd like to remind everybody who's with us today that you're welcome to ask questions of our panelists. You can uh, drop it into the chat box and um, I'm happy to put questions to our panelists here. Um, but in the meantime, I wanted to just um, put a question out there for the three of you and um, we can, whoever wants to go first, feel free to jump in. But we talked a little bit um, about donors and um, it sounds like um, in your situations, this is, you're, you're not, uh, arts and cultural organizations that are in crisis from what I'm understanding, but you are people who are experts in this field. And I think there are probably people who are joining us today who perhaps are struggling to keep up the contributions from their donors. Um, so do you have any kind of thoughts on how to keep those relationships fresh? How do you continue to draw in support from donors? Um, in particular, are donors as enthusiastic about virtual programming as they would be for the kind of in real life programming that perhaps they're used to, to seeing. Would anyone like to jump in to try to help us with an answer to that? Um, I'll, I'll try. I, I, our donors, um, because of, you know, with Facebook and eBlast, everything like that, you can get the word out to people, to a lot of people. Um, so actually we get worldwide, I mean, people from Moscow and China and everybody watching things, but actually our board, our trustees have been very supportive in this time. And, and also they watch, you know, th these videos and or webinars and things. And I think um, they realize that these are difficult times and um, we've been lucky that they, they continue to be some supportive of, of what we do. So I think if you have a quality programming and, uh, you know, even if it's virtual, um, it, 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 it gets to them in a way, most of our board people and think live in the United States. So they're not here to partake in these, in these events. And, and now they can do it virtually. So that's, that's been helpful, I think. I can add one quick thing, more of a tactical suggestion. One of the things that we always try to do with our programs is evaluate them. <laughs> How well did we do against what we were trying to do? Um, and we have continued trying to do that with our virtual programs. Um, you know, Jennifer referenced before being able to see demographics. Sometimes that's actually a really helpful thing with digital programs that it is harder to collect with in-person programs. Um, so collecting as much information we can on how well we did. Um, did people feel they learned something? Did people feel that they that their behavior will change because of the program? Really trying to to capture some of that information and be able to share that that data um, with sponsors. So my again more of a tactical suggestion is being able to collect as much information about how much these programs still matter um, and in many ways matter really more than ever 
and that we all do continue to need this valuable, valuable support um, that sponsors and donors can provide. Um, and being able to say, here are some of the impacts we've seen. Um, please help us support these programs so that we can have even, even greater impact. May I um, also jump in here um, just for my small contribution to this discussion? The, the donors are not that frequent to the Greek ecosystem. So uh, you would, uh, besides uh, the funding from the Greek uh, Ministry of Culture and of course the two big uh, foundations available in Greece, really the performance scene would be looking for either sponsorships from private companies or even better for big European programs from EU, cultural EU programs that continue to support uh, performing arts. Uh, and from, from my previous knowledge, and I, I would say that it is very important to try to um, find and source programs that fit your identity as an organization and not to try and source funding from a program that would deviate you from your from your from your actual goal because there you wouldn't be able to uh, explore further um, the possibilities given and once the program is is finished once the funding is over there's not that much available for you as as a as a as a knowledge as knowledge received uh, yeah so okay. but yeah and um, Gabrielle, I'm going to stick with you. Um, we did receive a question from a member of the audience, which is for SS SNFCC. And the question is, what are new ways of engagement in programming arts programs, theater, dance, and music? Would you mind repeating, please? Sorry. Sure. Um, what are new ways of engagement in the performing arts programs, theater, dance, and music? Well, um, what... It's, it's very difficult uh, how an organization engages uh, digitally and through new mediums because you you really have to uh, maintain true to your core and, and your standards. For instance, if you're an, uh, if you're an, a self-funded uh, alternative organization, you're much you're interested to, to gain the next step. In, in your art form. Whereas if you are a big organization, you have other standards what you have to meet. I mean, your product needs to be more glossy. It needs to be more uh, easily and broadly accepted. So if if you, and I'm, I'm, I'm having, I, I, I'm talking about this because my previous um, uh, occupation was in an urban art center in downtown Athens where you you wouldn't mind how glossy or or refined the outcome was the the goal was to get your art form a step uh, beyond the, the current um, state and the what was currently perceived as 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 a given whereas now when when you when you have to program and when you have to produce for a a, 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 a an, an organization of the caliber and the and, and the magnitude of the SNFCC, you have to think more broadly. You have to present something that would be uh, ac ac accepted and refined and aiming to a d different size of an audience. So um, I think that this question has to be uh, answered in, diff in different ways, depending on who you work for and what it is that you aim to do, what, who the final uh, recipient of your of your event of your production is. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I have another question from the audience. This is for Liz, the Smithsonian. Um, someone's asking, um, how can Greek organizations partner with the Smithsonian? What kind of inter international programs do you bring to organizations around the world, and can you give some examples? Sure. Nobody ever likes answering a question with a question, 
but I, I would pose the question back, what, what might you be interested in? Um, I think we love new partners. So um, I, I guess to, to put in a plug for, for our international website, global.si.edu, and I can drop that in the chat, describe some of the international programs and partnerships that we have. Um, but as silly as it sounds, really kind of the sky's the limit. The, the Smithsonian likes to say that we do everything from A to Z, anthropology to zoology, um, and all different types of programs and partnerships are of interest to us. So whether it's, again, some sort of exchange program in person or virtual, um, some kind of advisory program where we're sharing expertise and trying to, to build new projects, programs. Um, you know, we, we worked with uh, museums in Bahrain to help them rethink kind of their education department um, and how to introduce different types of education programs, particularly working with school audiences. Um, but we always recognize that we have a lot to share, but we also have a lot to learn. So, you know, that's why I started with the question of, of what it is that would be of, of interest to you and to your Greek organizations. But um, the short answer is we'd love to hear from you and have a conversation about it. So global.si.edu um, is our website where we talk about these international programs. And if, if you reach out, um, something can eventually come back to me and I'd love to have a discussion about that. Thanks, Liz. Um, and then I have our final question from the audience um, that I'll put to the three of you, which is, are you seeing challenges with internet connectivity and stable connections? So I think what we're getting at here is the issue of accessibility. Um, not everyone has a high speed internet connection at home. So how can, you know, how can you reach people that might not have the best accessibility to the internet? I can say that our programs all seem to be um, live streamed on Facebook. I, don't ask me how that happens. But Imagine. We yeah. Huge numbers of people. And I don't know about the quality. I don't know much about the quality of that, but um, it certainly does expand your, your audience. <laughs> okay. I was going to say, I don't have a, gr a great answer to that. I mean, one of the things we're seeing we we run some major programs in Iraq, in the northern part of Iraq, and we have been discussing a lot recently this this very problem that some of the things where we'd like to be doing right now are really stymied by the fact that there's bad internet connection. Um, and and I would say we we haven't totally cracked that nut. Um, in some instances, I think Facebook Live is a great example. Also, just recording programs and sharing them, and and so that people can have access to them. In, in different ways, but um, the internet issue is a big one. Um, and also working with partners who might not be as familiar with online learning. So we've been trying to talk about how to transform some of the programs we would normally have been doing in person in Iraq to an online format um, and really recognizing that we need to be doing things in a way that works for our partners. Um, you know, just because it's something that that we can devise and and deliver doesn't mean it's something that works locally. Um, so I would say a great question and something that we um, are constantly trying to to figure out. OK, um, so let me we, we do have a final question that I'd like to put to the three of you um, and Liz, you, you spoke to this a little bit when you talked about, you know, moving forward, thinking about what arts and cultural organizations can be to society, um, a, a civic organization, a cultural nutrient. Um, but I would like to just ask the three of you quickly to just um, tell us what your thoughts are about the future. How do you see your organization a year from now when hopefully this pandemic is a memory? Um, and how are cultural and educational organizations not only gonna survive this pandemic and all of the upheaval, but how might you envision them thriving and coming out stronger. So um, I will just ask each of you to give us an answer for that. So I will start with you, Jennifer. Yes, I, I see us having um, much more global outreach than we've had in the past. We've been a sort of small, self-contained research institute um, doing our own little in-depth studies of, you know, Greek amphoras and things like that. But now, now we, um, feel much more the part of our mission is, is not only to expand from the classical world, but to include all of Greece 
um, up to modern times, but also to um, project our programming at various levels so it can be accessible. We have a special intern who does K-12 programs now, which we never had in the past. Um, and we have these, as I say, these webinar series, and we'll do more and more of that. And I think it's it's a tremendous opportunity for us to help educate the world about the major contributions that Greece has made to civilization, culture, and history. Okay, thanks, Jennifer. Gabriella, can we turn to you for your thoughts on the future? Yes, of course. Um, I, th I think this, this situation is a, a very big opportunity for all arts organizations to ca kind of enlarge their audience and uh, and besides their geographical region um, and also it's much more easy to maintain a close contact and a close collaboration with other countries and other cultures we we now have become more and more accustomed to having meetings and discussions online with people not uh, that are not in 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 Greece or wherever each each one of us is, but what I would really like to to say is that the importance of physical presence as well. So I mean, be, being the meeting place, being the agora as the SNFCC has. So the the ideal uh, future would be both welcoming audiences and maintaining our contacts uh, uh, online uh, because. Culture and art is also about being in a space and exchanging ideas physically. Yeah, so this is very important, I think. Thanks, Gabriella. I agree. And Liz, any any final thoughts on yeah, the say the very unenviable position of of speaking after two very accomplished speakers? I agree with everything there. I think that again, there are a lot of things that have been very difficult, but I think. Um, we've also really learned a lot and learned the value of being able to reach people we would not be able to reach otherwise, but also collaborate with colleagues, um, have exchanges exactly like this. You know, I think these were happening um, in fits and spurts before, but, you know, we see it happening a lot now. And I think that that's something really exciting. You know, we can't wait to open at full capacity um, down the road. And I think, you know, what we're seeing is that people are so hungry to be back in cultural institutions, and that's really heartening to see. Um, but we'd love to be able to keep up all these relationships that have started um, during during this time. So everything my colleague said, I, I fully agree with. Okay, thank you, Liz. And thank you so much to our incredible panelists today. This has been such a terrific conversation. I feel like we could go on and on. Um, I'm sorry to those of you in our audience who we, for whom we didn't get to your questions, um, but I hope that you'll continue to just um, stay with us for this uh, programming through the Co-Museum. Um, so to Jennifer, Gabriella, and Liz, Please keep up the amazing work. Um, your work is so important and um, we look forward to continuing to cooperate with you and support you in your endeavors in the future here at the U.S. Embassy in Athens. Um, and to everyone who joined us in the audience, thank you so much for spending your Friday afternoon with us. Um, and I hope everyone stays healthy um, and safe during this difficult time. I would like to invite my colleague Jennifer Schuler back on. She has a couple of uh, points that she wanted to raise before we sign off, uh, but this will conclude our panel for today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Before we close, I'll mention that the 10th edition of the Co-Museum Conference is just around the corner. It will be held virtually from December 2nd through the 4th, so please mark your calendars. There will be keynote presentations, panel discussions, fireside chats, workshops, and master classes with prominent museum and cultural leaders from around the world. Registrations will open on November 16th, so please stay tuned. We hope to see you all there. And until then, very best wishes for health and strength to all of you. Kalispera.